I think I it's can't... okay. I mean, if you're yeah. maybe I, I should just... say, we'll just say it now. If you haven't seen the movie, then pause the pause this episode. Yes. Go see the movie, then come back, listen to the rest of the episode. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Disclaimer out of the way. Thank you, sir. All right. Welcome back, everyone, to the Family Movie Time Podcast. This is your host, Jeff M. Giordano. And our special guest today is Jade Terrio, the painted Jade on social media. Jade is a comedian, a performer, a songwriter, a creative renaissance person. Um, very pleased to have Jade back on the podcast. We spoke about six or seven months ago about the secret garden so that's an episode we already recorded check it out um today is going to be a good one for you it's a movie from the 2020s which i haven't i admit i have not done a lot of 2020s films so far however today we're going to give our attention to the movie perfect days from 2023 um directed by vim vendors uh, the excellent filmmaker, he's made several films over the years. I, one of my all-time favorites is The Wings of Desire, directed by Vim Vanders. Um, I would say that is up there, one of my top ten favorites. Vanders is also known for Paris, Texas, The American Friend, um, I can't list them all, but but a lot a lot of good films and artistic films he's made documentaries um he just don't stop and i hope he keeps making awesome movies so without further ado jade i'll let you have the mic if you want to say anything mm. else about yourself and um your initial impressions of perfect days oh god do i talk about myself or the movie first the movie is so good um oh i did so thank you jeff uh I have to tell you, I blindsided you. I changed my social media handle. It's a jaded comic now. So it's a much darker. <laughs> I, can but, put uh, that in, I can put that in the description for the video too. Your current, your current social media and how people <laughs> can find you and how they could maybe book you for a comedy show or uh, some type of performance. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. But uh, enough about me. Uh, th this movie, yeah, this is my first introduction uh, to this director, so I'm this filmmaker, so I'm very, very impressed. Uh, yeah, that movie, I worked overtime at my day job today, probably because of that movie. I was like, I am going to <laughs> overachieve today. <laughs> Nothing can bother me. Um... Yeah, God, I have so much to say about this film. <clears throat> um, it was, uh, yeah, I guess this podcast automatically does spoilers, so everyone knows that. But um, yeah, it was just a, uh, it, 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 the pacing, it was definitely a slower paced movie. You know, you feel like you're in a museum with these kind of movies, you know, just really like, you're almost feeling it more than you're watching it. Um and and especially you know the the kind of like it was repetitive but it wasn't because every time this guy went back to work you know more it was so, such a day in the life movie but like the, things were rippling uh, around um yeah just everything so many parts in the movie uh the whole just how every time he would step outside and look at you know, it was a very Zen Buddhist movie. It's based in Tokyo. You know, I think he, I think he, the the filmmaker made it with another Japanese filmmaker. Um, but uh, you know, the, 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 and and the plot follows this um man who uh, cleans toilets for a living. That's 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 what he does, and he's of modest means, and um, it's just kind of about his routine. And, and, and and you know there is a, a somewhat of a narrative element to it, but but it's but it's day in the life in that sense. Um, but uh, yeah, he's he's presumably a Buddhist, so the whole movie takes on this Zen Buddhist 
kind of sick theme. And just when he, like, steps outside and looks at the trees or nature, like, you know, he, someone has to use the bathroom, he, he, he really notices it. And I've related to that in times of my life when I just felt um, really, like, in awe of the world, you know, just, like, going out thinking, like, if, if an alien civilization saw us, what would they think? You know, everything is so beautiful and fantastic. And I, I get these moments in my life where it, it's very fleeting. It doesn't happen often. But, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've maybe felt this, too, where you're just like, wow. Um, but that part of the movie really held me. Uh, the the disability representation was was you know more you know as a as a disability representation kind of too I like myself um, it was great uh, sorry I'm just rambling on about all these things that that you know this character is it, just like a you know this kid with Down syndrome who's friends with the the protagonist and it was kind of a redeeming moment for the coworker and the protagonist eyes and you know, it's like, oh, I spent with this kid with Down syndrome, but, but the, the, the way, I don't know how the filmmaker did it, but the way he did it was so honest and genuine and not over the top and not exaggerated and it was real and it, it was just, a, it was, there was so much authenticity about that moment, so it didn't feel like a wasted scene. It added depth to the to the, this character. It was just, I don't know. So I thought that was done very, very well. Um, yeah, God, so much to say. <laughs> I have like a list of like 10 more things, but. <laughs> I want to, I want to add that. Um, Please. So there's nine, there's nine public toilets featured in this film. <sighs> and they were originally Originally, the intention with building these nine public toilets was to help welcome visitors to Japan as part of the planned Summer Olympics in 2020. Wow. So basically, the pandemic delayed the Olympics in Japan, and Koji Yane, I think is how you say his last name, he was a senior executive for um, this company and he sought a way to still make the toilets known internationally. So his idea was to contact several screenwriters and advertise advertisers. So it's one big commercial. That's well, so the original, his original intention was to somehow find a director or filmmaker to make a documentary about the toilets. So, um, yeah. Vim Vendors was given an invitation to produce a documentary, but instead he wanted to make it a narrative film, you know, yeah. with a script and characters and not people just playing as themselves. Mm -hmm. um, the film was only shot in 17 days, and um, the screenplay was written in about three weeks. Um, wow. What, like, what really struck me about it was that it was such a quiet film and um even if you watch this movie and fall asleep you're gonna wake up it's still gonna be a pleasant movie like you're still gonna be kind of in yeah. that world and i think some movies work like that like if you fall asleep like in the movie theater yeah. you wake up you know you don't you don't miss that much sometimes and yeah with this film perfect days i think it's one of the best things i've seen in like for movies that have come out in the 2020s. Um, yeah. I really think it's a strong movie that shows the humanity of people. And this guy, he's kind of mysterious to me in the beginning. I'm not sure, you know, what, what he does, you know, if, he, if there's some other layer to his life, some other hidden layer. But then you come to yeah. learn about his family difficulties with family members and you know that stuff later in the film and it is like you said earlier it's a slow paced kind of a story and i loved all the like scenes of the trees 
you know, blowing in the breeze and um, the, the way that he would listen to cassette tapes for his music on the way to yeah. work. He would put a cassette tape in his truck mm -hmm. and then he would just read books at home at night. I mean, it was such a refreshing uh, look at his lifestyle. And um, Japan is such a beautiful country. You get to see, you know, the city, you get to see these kind of other people, too, that he comes across or, you know, mm -hmm. that the energy that he gives to them and the energy they give to him. J Japan, it was in Tokyo, right? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, it was in Tokyo. It was like, because it was for the, they were setting up the toilets for the Olympics, yeah. Um, it, it was so interesting. Um how you know you you would have these toilets you know I've, I've heard about them that i don't think i've actually seen them where it's like the the windows just automatically glaze up to like these weird robot toilets and the, you know that that pleasant exchange he had with the american or freaking japanese and all this stuff um but uh you know you would see that these really nice toilets and then like poverty like you know the homeless guy and the, the drunk guy and you know just in, in the, the dirt and you know it's like um but uh but no it's the whole yeah it all reminded me of san francisco too oh my god like the overpasses and it, it was just this is i i believe we're sister cities so uh, maybe i could be wrong but uh it would make sense um but uh yeah his life he was mysterious uh one thing i noticed about his character was and i couldn't tell if it was a loneliness or an aloneness and i think that was a distinction because you know and i'm you know i'm trying to empathize with my own life with this character like you know you get into a routine where you're everything is in equilibrium and you're doing your routine and you're maybe a little bit of an introvert so you go to work you go to your favorite bar you come home and read. That's what this guy did, you know? And that's like heaven to a lot of people, including myself. Like, but then you ask yourself, do I have time to have another person doing this with me? You know? And, you know, it was kind of so endearing when he brought his niece along to uh, <laughs> to work with him in the movie. And, uh, you know, another thing that, that there's a digression here. This movie also taught me that the kids are all right. Um, and uh, I felt this way in my own life too. I've met a lot of Gen Zs lately in my life, and I'm shocked at how well spoken and well read and polite and good work ethic and honest, and they're interested in in the past and everything's being remixed. And I saw all of that in this movie, you know. With the exception of the loser co-worker, I think he was the <laughs> comic relief outlier to that. But but the girls in the movie were just very well spoken. His co-worker, it's interesting, he... Yeah, he's interesting. I guess he could be considered the guy that, you know, he's very, um, you know, driven by his, his kind of immediate, you know, um, desires and, and, and just... You know, if he doesn't get something, then he has a kind of a upsetting, yeah. you know, big reaction. And it's yeah. just like he has a lot to learn. He's very immature. I guess that's the best way to describe him. Very immature, his coworker. That You know, that's so interesting that you say that. Cause, yeah, it's very, like, now you say, like, yeah, that's his whole problem. He's immature. Um, but it's also very interesting that... Um, the filmmaker, or there was a decision made to have a, a, a disabled, a young disabled actor as his friend, someone with Down syndrome. It, it's just a very interesting choice, and I, I don't think it's a um, necessarily an offensive choice or like a problematic choice. I just think it's, um, you know, it's like, oh, okay, like I see what we're, what the symbolism is kind of showing, um, and and it would make sense if, if it was a real story too, you know. So I think it was great. Yeah, the coworker was an interesting character. I, right? um, as, as just like a balance in his life. The the um, the actresses, the female performers, 
Um, you have the 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 gal that is that his younger coworker is dating. She listens to the to the cassette tapes, um, you know, and and is enjoying kind of the retro. You know the texture of the tape and like looking at the 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 cover and the tracks and all that stuff. Yeah. And then later on, you get the um, the sister of the main character. Um, yeah. And you know their dynamic and like kind of their the fraughtness or the tension um, and mm -hmm. the, like things aren't resolved. So it was, it was, it was, there's quite a range of different kinds of people. Not everybody's like is seemingly, you know, happy and content and content and just, you know, balanced yeah. and, and happy as perhaps the main character. I think, I think something that the filmmaker did really well was, um, especially, and this was in part due to the pacing slow slower pacing he made this guy's perfect life seem like an impenetrable wall in the beginning like nothing nothing what could stop this you know he's locked in and all it took was for his niece to visit and then but but it was actually not all it took because because then the thing that happened after he had another setback when his co-worker quit so and then he had another setback when he um, caught the caught the, the barmaid and the and the other guys because now he's embarrassed. So he kind of just went through this series of of unfortunate things that were and actually it probably started even earlier when when he gave the coworker his money. That was probably the actual beginning, but that was a subtle one. That was just like oh you know, um, but. The, the moral of that was just to show, like, it could, I, like, things, anything could, could topple everything, could, could make you break your sobriety, or whatever, you know, like, like this character did, and so, or maybe that was implied, I don't know if he was, but, you know, um, sorry, I guess we shouldn't spoil, actually spoil the movie, <laughs> is it safe? I feel bad, but as we get to near the end of the movie, I'm like, oh. Oh. <laughs> the emotional arc and the psychological stuff that he goes through, you mentioned his generosity with his younger coworker, giving the guy money. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that was an interesting choice that he makes. Mm -hmm. And I love that scene in the, in the record store where his coworker, <laughs> Without really telling Hirayama, he's like taking his cassette tapes to go sell them. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. hey, these are worth a lot of money. Like, I need yeah. money, so you should sell your your music cassette tapes and yeah, get just money. So over the top, like <laughs> but funny looking dude too. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and he just dragged them along. I mean. It almost well, it almost has that like Abbott and Costello dynamic. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this guy, the protagonist, he's just so like Zen, like Buddhist, like he's just like, yeah, drag me to the store. I mean, he still has a backbone, you know. He's not gonna, you know, get what you know. He's not gonna sell his cassettes, but you know, he he just kind of keeps his head down, does his job, has his cassettes. You know, he'll throw the guy a bone. You know, I mean, God, the whole yin and yang in this movie, like the extremes and some, like, like the last scene that that we have to talk about, the last scene, like, like of him crying but not crying in the car, and he's every single one of us has had that experience of listening to a song and just feeling everything in your life and everything just happening to you right there. And that actor, I, I'm so terrible with everyone's name in this, in this production, but the actor is just did not, it was like crying and smiling at the same time. 
And that was that Buddhist, that was that balance. That was that, you know? Just, oh, God. Koji Yakusho is, Koji. The, is the main character's real name. Um, Tokyo, to, Tokyo Emoto is the younger co-worker. Uh, and his name is Takashi, the character's name. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about the music? Did, did you, do you personally like a lot of those songs that were played in the film on those cassette tapes? Oh, yeah. I love the whole 70s, 80s, psychedelic rock, Lou Reed, you know, all that. It's, uh, it was great. Um, yeah. And, and the use of soundtrack in, in this way, just like using the music in a very um, intentional way, you know. Like, yeah, he's actually playing it in the car. It's not just background. Um, but, yeah. I, I believe there were some Japanese um, songs in there as well. Well, and then the Japanese rendition of uh, House of the Rising Sun. I was, oh, my God. <laughs> that, was that, that was awesome. The woman singing it live in the bar. Yeah. Yeah, oh. was, like, almost surreal. It was beautiful. Oh, so good. Um, what do you? I'm curious. What do you think about the... Um, I believe there was an interesting moral or moralizing nature to the story in terms of the character who had cancer, who he met at the end of his very long, very bad week. Um, and, you know, I feel like the moral of the story was, you know, in the most explicit basic of terms, like, oh, somebody could always have it worse, you know, or something like that. Um, but what do you think of that? Do you think that is what the film was trying to convey, or do you think there was a deeper uh, or not deeper meaning? I think it's very open-ended. I mean, it to me, I would say part of it is about like appreciating the beauty that's immediately around you and yeah. making making the most of like the you know the people that you interact with on a daily basis and try to like yeah. do s some type of work that you can be proud of. It seemed like he really took pride and he cared about his job and he looked forward to going to his job too. Mm -hmm. I think that's maybe something in the contemporary world. It's maybe challenging to like really enjoy what you're doing. Um, yeah. And um he seemed to be he seemed to be comfortable with solitude, which I think was maybe also one of the points of the film, the way he made use of his time, you know, after work and he had a way of um creating a sense of peace like in his home. Yeah. Um, that was that was nice to watch and in his, in his home with, like, under very modest means, like, a glass of water, like, no bed frame, public <laughs> showers, you know, it's just like. <laughs> it was, um, there is, I mean, I did some research. I don't know how valuable this is to know, but the the director was asked, like, you know, is there a kind of a backstory to this char main character? Like, you know, when you were working on the script and he said, well, the guy used to be like this business person. He had a nice car. He was making a lot of money. And then he just wasn't happy with his life. And then he just changed everything up and started yeah. living more modestly and, you know, got into, went to like gardening. And then he eventually found this job with the toilets um, with respect to Japanese Society and toilets, those are pretty clean toilets for being public toilets. Oh, that guy, I mean, damn. Yeah, oh, you mean before he went in, yeah. They weren't bad. I was like, I was watching him grab him, grab the trash with his bare hands, and I was like, that must be, I mean, must not be that bad. <laughs> yeah. When I, went, when I went to Japan years ago, there was not much litter in the streets. People seem to have a way of not 
you know, trash in the place. They really, it was yeah. frowned upon if you threw stuff on the ground and it was trash. You know, you, you were, yeah. people respected the environment, respect the environment, I think. And um, they, they look out for, you know, that kind of yeah. stuff. It's like what we wish San Francisco was, but it isn't. Um, there's one day I, I also thought of, you said this a little earlier in the, in the podcast, but um, uh, about how we always want characters to have conflict or be in pain or, you know, suffer in some way, as we suffer on a daily basis. Um, but, uh, but one thing I noticed with this movie is that there were, you know, there were points in the movie where our character was suffering. And other characters were suffering, but because the movie started from such a pleasant base and was such a pleasant slow burn and such a day in the life, I felt that every moment of discomfort felt stronger than than a normal movie. I like 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 I think the first moment of real real discomfort. Um, was when the girlfriend of the coworker was crying in the car. That's when things felt like, oh, oh, we're not okay. We're not okay. You know, this is this is not beautiful Japanese bonsai garden anymore. Um, even though that was in in retrospect, like not a severe scene. It was just a kind of a subtle sad thing, but it just felt so much stronger in this movie. And then all the subsequent things that happened also felt stronger. Yeah. With um, the idea of, you know, films from, is it 2024, 2023, or the early 2020s, are there any other movies similar to this movie that you, that you come to your mind that would be, you know, family friendly, live action, um, you know, not oh. very not very violent, not a lot of drugs or sensuality or language, you know. And this movie was like lemon curd when I've only ever had cherry. I don't know, this is getting Yeah, no, I God, I wish. Could I ask you, um when you were a younger person, were the Muppets on your rotation for movies that you watched? Uh you know what, I, I think, no, but I've seen scenes of the Muppets, and I've always laughed. I've just never been in the right room for the Muppets. <laughs> I was deprived of the Muppets. <laughs> I was a Sesame Street kid. I was big on Sesame Street. Uh, I watched Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but that, that movie's kind of disturbing, too. <laughs> I, no, I, even, I agree. Ra Who Framed Roger Rabbit, I rewatched it. Uh, recently, yeah. as research for the yeah. podcast, pretty it's, yeah. too, it's too much. No, I'm so happy. I, I need I need this podcast in my life, Jeff, so that I can watch a wholesome movie every now and again. So don't don't forget about me. Um, what what else could you mention? We we're at like the oh, I know half an hour mark. I want to ask you. Yeah. You know, what else did you watch growing up, or what else do you return to when you're mm. in the mood for like a comfort film or something to help you relax? Are there any movies that you will put on? Um, I, not now, only because I'm not much of a movie rewatcher. That's the only reason. Um, but um, in terms of um, wholesome movies I've seen recently. Versus from a kid, uh, it's a documentary, but I I, I like I like the octopus movie. What was that? What was that one? My, my my octopus teacher. Yeah, that one. That was great. I watched yeah. that with my sister. That was a good one. Yeah, the um the uh, the disabled people in my life will will shun me for saying that because the the, the octopus teacher beat out another wonderful movie, Crip Camp. For the Oscar, um, good, great documentary too. Yes, yes. I don't, I don't know if that one's family friendly though, because I think maybe that one had some some scandalous 
but I'm not sure. I had a phobia because when I was very young, I was watching The Simpsons, which I also liked a lot as a kid. Very, I think that that's a very family friendly show. And uh, and I was watching it. I was laying on the couch with my dad and my dad. I was probably like four or five years old, and my dad fell asleep, and the X Files came on. And there was a head that was not attached to a body, and they were doing experiments on it. And I about and I was I couldn't turn it off, and I was stuck there. And my dad was just, I started crying. And since then, I couldn't watch Snow White because there was a head in a mirror. I I couldn't watch anything with statues. Statues and heads and robots and things that were trying to be human but were not human, you know, like deformed faces. And then, I don't know what happened in college. I got like an interest for film, maybe. And something completely flipped. When I started to understand that comedy and horror were kind of on the same genre spectrum, um, that's when it rationalized in my head and something flipped and I went from like being irrationally afraid of it to just eating it up. <laughs> if you were if you were paid to write a family friendly movie that was live action, could you do it? If I was paid. Yeah. Yeah. You know <laughs> well how much? <laughs> I'm trying to think of um, not 3D animated, like maybe live action. Um, I mean, there's the classics, Christmas Story, such a you can't not watch that movie with um, with a family member. What um, about since you're on the Christmas movie topic? What uh, about Ernest Saves Christmas? I haven't heard of it. Ernest Saves Christmas, no. No, you know Jim Varney, like the Ernest movies? That character, uh, Ernest? Ernest, so scared, Ernest Scared Stupid, Ernest Goes to School, or Back to School. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do know. Is that, wait, is that a, that's not a book. That's a movie? There, there are a series of films with this actor. You should put on okay. your watch list when the Christmas season comes around. It's close. When okay. It, when it's here... You want to you wanna find Ernest Saves Christmas. Oh, I will. I'm going to look for that. And I will be doing a future to give a little bit of uh, some, you know, um, news. Uh -huh. I'll, be, I'll be doing an episode about Ernest Saves Christmas in the near future for the podcast. Oh, cool. That sounds great. So Jim Varney is the main star, and he is, you know, a very uh, hilarious funny performer he passed oh. away some years ago however the movies live on he was like um he was like a very studied shakespearean actor prior to his hollywood career and this character oh, wow. his this character of ernest you know became what he was famous for um and he even did commercials for pizza pizza companies and all kinds of stuff. He was like on top of the world um, years yeah. ago. Anyway, Ernest Saves Christmas. I think okay. I think that one is the most wholesome, family friendly of all the Ernest films. Cool. I will write that down. Ernest Saves Christmas. Yeah. Give me a break from uh, Rudolph. No. <laughs> um, disability, yeah. disability visibility in films, in cinema. Um, sure. As a disabled person, as yourself, what what advice or recommendations would you give to independent filmmakers or Hollywood mainstream filmmakers? Um, yeah, uh, two different answers. Um, well, maybe not. I don't know. Well, I guess for independent filmmakers, um, you know, you have... You know, you're limited in what you have at your disposal, obviously. 
um, if uh, if you want to tell a disability story, um, you should do it with disabled people. <laughs> you know? I mean, I think that um, should be should be a given. I would say, but a lot of people don't follow that given. Um, authentic casting as much as you can. I mean, why are you making the story? Um, but you know, again, independent filmmakers are limited, so uh, whatever you can do. Um, and just, uh, yeah, if you're a disabled filmmaker, I mean, work, you know, something that I've had to tell myself to do is work with other disabled creators, you know, because when we don't work together, um, we, we don't grow together, you know, and, uh, we do have a culture, you know, we're, we're not just disabled people, we're, we're a culture of disability, so, um, you know, I think that uh, I think there's a severe lack of diversity in the types of narratives that are being told. Um, I, I, for example, I very rarely see disabilities disability stories where we're exploring the relationships between disabled people. It's always disabled people versus society, or you know. But 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 it fails to recognize that we have a, a whole community, you know. And you know you don't have to overstate it or anything. You know you should never overstate anything when you're trying to make a good film. But um, just recognizing that there are those stories out there. Um, and uh, for yeah, for independent filmmakers, just. Just, just be open to knowing that and thinking along those lines. And for mainstream, uh, you know, always strive for authentic casting. I mean, obviously, you know, you don't want a bad actor, but, um, but you know, make a solid effort, you know, um, and uh, understand that the reason why many disabled people don't audition is due to lack of access, lack of opportunities disenfranchisement so anything that if you're a big mainstream film company anything that you can do to empower that community as you would any disenfranchised or minority community you know black you know indigenous whatever whatever you would do for them you know do for disabled people um and uh and also not just authentic casting like have disabled people in your crew have them holding the camera, have them, you know, just have hire us, hire us, damn it, we're here, um, accommodate us, reasonably accommodate us, you know, I know film, film sets run on tight, insane schedules, but, you know, usually what you think we're lacking, we're making up for in a completely different avenue, such as experience and perspective that you won't get otherwise in your film, so, uh, yeah, all that preaching like like the Lord intended. No. <laughs> we got about seven minutes left, so I want to okay. I want to zip through some questions. No worries, I'm I'm open to going over the little if you need. What do you think of the Wizard of Oz, the original Wizard of Oz? Um, it's a it's a classic. Um, it's got a nice. Nice. Uh, I like the Wizard of Oz because it's um. If I say it's formulaic, that sounds like it <laughs> diminishes the movie. But especially when you're a kid, it's got like a nice like. Okay, the lion with his heart. The the Tin Man with his what was it brain? No, the lion didn't have the brain. That's right. The Tin Man didn't have the heart. I don't remember. They all had. I I had a hard time with that movie because. When the witch, I was afraid of the witch. This is in my fear era. And I, I didn't, when she got crushed by the house and her leggings shriveled up. See, that was very violent to me as a kid. That was not family friendly. And more when the witch caught on fire, that was horrifying. Horrifying. So if you said, Jade, we're going to talk about this family friendly movie. I'd be like, what are you, insane? Um, so I guess that's my... So I, I, that's, I didn't watch a lot of movies as a kid because 
things like that would just terrify me. What about musicals? Do you have any favorite musicals? Only dark ones. <laughs> I uh, wasn't a big fan of uh, Sound of Music. I liked um, um, Moulin Rouge a lot. What What about for, a, it's not a family-friendly movie, but the um, the movie with Bjork as the star? Oh, Dan oh Dan yeah. My, dark? That's what I was going to say. Not, yeah, that's one of my favorite musicals of all time. Big Bjork fan. So, uh, love it. I love I love York as well, so we we can agree on that. Um, okay, good. <laughs> what about it's kind of a recent movie, The Peanut Butter Falcon. Oh, um, what was the premise of that? There's Again? a there's a there's a uh, heard of it. A person with Down syndrome is one of the actors. Yeah. And Shia LaBeouf is in the film as well. Oh, that's why I didn't watch it. No, it's, it's kind of um, like a buddy movie between uh, them, and it takes place in like the countryside and like the forest and the rural landscapes. I, I, I haven't seen it. Um, I I may have subconsciously avoided it for the same reason I subconsciously did not pick Wonder when you <laughs> when you gave me two films to pick from, uh, and not because let me let me let me clarify. I, I, I'm not saying that because they're bad movies. Um, I don't think they're bad movies, and I, I think they should be made, and I also haven't seen them, so I cannot actually definitively say whether they're bad movies. But based on the trailer, um, I guess the reason I personally uh, wasn't running to see them is because, I, because I, I'm so used to the disability stories that are told that I, I, I'm like, okay, when something is centered... When, when I can tell what a movie is about based on the trailer, I'm I'm just bored in general, you know. Like like I'm like okay, I know the premise here. I mean, Perfect Day is. I watched the trailer. I had no idea what the hell that movie is about. I was like, I do not know what I'm looking at. Um, so, uh, so I was more interested in watching that. Um, but um, I I appreciate those stories though. Um, Peanut Butter Falcon and uh, Wonder, the premise of Wonder, which is about a, a kid who um, has a deformed face, and uh, or, or that's not the right term for it. I, there's a much more politically correct term for it. I, I am I, facial difference. He has a facial difference, and and that might be a euphemism that. People with facial differences would scoff at me at even and be like, "No, we're deformed. Don't say that." No. Uh, but uh, there's one movie I did want to flag. It's not a family-friendly movie, but it's an important disability movie. And there's there's actually two movies. Um, the first one is called Spring Break Zombie Massacre. And I'm sorry, I don't know where you can find it, but I do, I do know where you can find the other movie, which is Sam and Maddie make a zombie movie, and it's about these two guys with Down syndrome who made a zombie movie, and it's the, the, the coolest looking movie ever, and they do everything, they direct it, they write it, you know, they recruit, they fucking it all together, and and so the, the movie that's probably easier to find is Sam and Maddie make a zombie movie, and it's a movie about them making their movie. So it's uh yeah I I uh, highly recommend. So so all right, I'm reading it now. Sam and Maddie make a zombie movie 2021. This is a documentary about the making of yeah. Spring, Break, Spring Break Zombie Massacre. Yeah. This film, <clears throat> for anybody who's watching, is available on Hoopla Digital, uh, which is you can get through your local public libraries. Most, I think, public libraries hopefully carry it. Yeah, I can help it. Hoopla Digital, Plex, Pluto TV, Tubi. You can rent it. Uh, you can rent it for like three bucks on other other platforms. Disabled movies should be made by disabled people. 
It just makes sense. Nothing about us without us, you know. Back to perfect days. Um, you mentioned earlier the Buddhist Zen quality or, you know, the energy, the vibe that Hi Hirayama, the main character, um, seems to encompass. Do you ever, does, does, do you ever meditate? Do you ever kind of have these moments where you're at peace? Trying to all the time. Um, yeah, it's so hard. I have been practicing transcendental meditation, which is kind of a literal answer to your question. Um, but uh, I, that's been helping me slow down. Um, are you familiar with the TM at all? Yeah. A little yeah. bit, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, I'll do celebrities do it. No, but uh, it's just a form of meditation. You sit quietly for 20 minutes twice a day. And, um, and you know, I kind of, I nerded out a little bit on it. You know, I, I splurged on uh, a couple classes and, you know, kind of got into it for a little bit. And uh, I'm not religious about it. You know, I don't do it every day. I would like to do it every day. Um, it's definitely a habit, but... But but it is nice to just kind of almost force yourself to just stop, you know, just to stop. Um, it does things to your brain. It really does. It, it 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 it's been like night and day for me, and how it's been like affecting um, how I how I deal with problems and stress and like days when I don't do it, I I could I could tell, you know. Um, so there's that, and yeah, just lately I've been, um, very happy, uh, it's kind of funny that I watched this movie last night, because it was like a nice little, like, life is good, and I'm watching, like, the most wholesome damn movie in the world, so, uh, life is good, um, so yeah, it was, uh, had you, had you heard of this film, Perfect Days, before I brought it up to you? No, I've been, you know, I've been sorely lacking in um, good filmmaker buddies in my life lately, so I've been a little kind of in the closet. But, uh, yeah, I have not, so thank you. Can you describe your disability for those unfamiliar or that, you know, if they're just listening, can you can you describe sure. them? Yeah, I'm a, a, I have a, a physical mobility disability so I so I can't really move my arms or my legs I'm, I'm in an electric wheelchair um, I have a robotic arm though that I use as a prosthetic in place of my my army army arms um, and uh, yeah I, I use a wheelchair um, uh, I have a um, I have a whole setup at home you know I have automatic doors I'm on, I'm all integrated you know so uh, that that would be my disability. Also, very severe ADHD, ruining my life. Um, but that's a whole other thing. I'm working on it. Is there anything else about Perfect Days, the movie, that you want to mention, or do you think people should go watch this film? Is this worth their time? Oh yeah, it's a it's a it's a great film. Um, don't watch it with someone who doesn't appreciate film. I will say that. This is definitely one of those movies where you don't want someone who uh, has to get up and fidget every 10 minutes. Um, but but it's a beautiful, beautiful film. Uh, it, it really gets you in the feels. Um, it is entertaining. It's very entertaining. So just, just feel it. Just really commit to it. Watch it and just commit and just be in it for those two hours. It's definitely worth it. I will share just to help folks out. Um, the movie, <clears throat> if you want to look at it, um, it is available on Hulu. Yeah, it's, that's how I was. It's also available to rent uh, on various mm -hmm. platforms. Um, I think mm -hmm. it's also on DVD. 
Thanks for your time tonight. Yeah. And I will say, Perfect Days, it's rated PG. It's two hours and four minutes. So it's, you know, it's, it's a lengthy film, but I think even at two hours, I was um, engaged and I was... Uh, yeah, I was into it, and you know, the energy, the the type of um, convincing performances. It was, I think, it's worth you know two two hours of someone's time. Yeah, it's definitely worth it. Um, it it picks up too. Don't give up on it. Just enjoy yeah. it. Really, just enjoy it. Yeah, don't don't you know? It's it's you know, it's. Uh, We'll just leave it at that. It's worth your time. <laughs> oh, I found... Sorry, I'm being a narcissist and talking about me again. It's um, all right. Go ahead. I'll let you have... Yeah, go ahead. No, I found the name of the movie that I'm in. Uh, it's called uh, Rise of the Super Tromets. <laughs> That's what it's called. And when okay. is this going to come out again? It's going to come out in 2025. On well, will there be... Will there will there be some theatrical showings as well? Yes, I don't have the dates for those yet, but there will be a screening. Um, do not, yeah, Dad, it's so funny you had me on this podcast. Do not bring your children to this movie. Um, don't even bring your family. Really, don't bring even the adults in your life. Make sure they're very. Uh, uh, open-minded people. It's a, it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard, uh, it's a hard one. <laughs> it's not perfect days. I'll let you. I should okay. go enjoy your evening. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeff. That's always nice. And um, maybe I could have you back for maybe a Muppet film or something else in the future. Absolutely. So. But yeah, I appreciate everybody who tunes in and listens. If you have um, suggestions or if maybe you're bold enough to come on an episode, maybe we can make it happen. You could email me. I'll put a contact email in the in the description for the video. You know, re read the description and you'll you'll get all the info, all the all the good stuff. Yeah. So, but yeah, until next time. Have a good night, Jade, and um, we'll we'll talk soon. I'll see you again. Have a good night, Jeff. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>